once you begin your career, it gets really difficult to continue to build yourself on the side. Not only the pressures of work and other things going on in your life, but also at work, you may not be getting the opportunities to continue to grow yourself and your skill sets. It can just be tasks in the day to day. But how do you keep up with an eight plus hour a day job and keep building yourself on the side at the same time without burning yourself out and exhausting all of your energy? Uh, my name is William and thank you for listening in. I'm going to share with you some of the techniques that I've developed and some of the things that I do on the side to continue to grow my own skills, continue to move myself in my career and to do that without burning myself out. As I mentioned, my name is William and I'm VP of engineering at Forbes. I actually started coding around the age of 12, but my drive wasn't to write code. And it wasn't because I intrinsically loved math or, or had some passion for engineering. What I really loved is making things. And I started to code because I needed tools in order to make some of the things that I had in mind that I wanted to create. It wasn't just coding though. I loved doing drawings, right? And anything that I could really make. And it was that journey, it was that process. It was making my idea come to life that really drove me and brought me into engineering. When my career actually started, I worked in agencies from starting my own to working for some of the biggest in the business. And working there, it was all about making things for other people, right? It was about bringing their ideas to life. And that didn't bother me. Whether it was my idea outside of work or someone else's, it was that process of creation. But it had certain stresses of working all day in an agency setting and being kind of a coder for hire or a leader for hire to build someone else's project. And it became increasingly difficult for me to go home after that and continue to work on my own things. So I need to find ways to keep making myself better. How do I learn more? How do I become a better engineer? How do I become a better leader, right? How do I develop these skills? And also, how do I do the things that I want to do? How do I build the things that I want to build without fully exhausting myself? So at Forbes in my current role, I'm VP of engineering, and I lead a team of about 50 engineers. Everything on Forbes.com and the tools that power it is built by my team. And 50 is actually a pretty small team for a website that big. Forbes is one of the top 15 visited uh, websites within the US. And those 50 engineers build everything from the front end of Forbes.com, which is one of the major teams. That's everything you see from the articles you read to the under 30 lists that launch and, and uh, whatever custom experiences happen there. To the teams that build the content management systems that the journalists are writing in, the AI assisted tools that are helping them uh, enhance their content pick the right images, curate how things are, are written for the web, and then also teams that handle things like content syndication and legal. And that's, that's a lot. And within the demands of that job, it really does mean that I'm on 24-7, 365. If something goes wrong on Forbes.com, if something happens on that website, of course, there are people on call that are first responders, and I'm not always that person. But at the same time, if something is happening, if there is a major incident, that's going to trickle up to me as well in terms of me being aware of it and having to jump in, regardless of when that is that that happens, but also in terms of accountability. But how do I manage having a job that is 24-7, 365, those responsibilities, and still doing things on my own? In addition to everything for work, I, I like building my own skills, right? How do I become a better writer? How do I become a better illustrator? How do I become a better coder, right? How do I build my own brand, right? How do people know who I am when I speak at conferences? How do people... Uh, build and, and rely on the credibility of my word when they see blog posts that I write or something that I've published somewhere else. And at the same time, how do I handle that and still decompress at the end of the day, express myself, be an individual, and not just be in a constant state of exhaustion? So my biggest piece of advice for this is that I treat everything like it's life. It's all life. I do not believe in the concept of work and life balance. Just like there isn't a concept of family and life balance, friend and life balance, Netflix and life balance. If we want to slice everything up in that pie chart, you're not left with anything that's life. You're just left with tasks and things that you're doing throughout the day. It's all a part of who you are. It's all a part of what you do from the moment that you wake up until you go to bed. And work is at least, at least half of that time that you're awake, right? So if you're viewing that as something that's separate from your life, it's, it's going to be tiring just having that mental mode. Right. So how, so to me, it's all about how do I find ways to manage my energy as well as my time so that I'm not in a constant state of like, oh, well, I can't believe I have to do another hour of something for work, even though, you know, 6 p.m. has already happened or I've already had dinner with my family. Right. And now I have to jump back in. To me, jumping back in isn't one thing or another. It's it's all a part of my life and what I'm doing. Oh, cool. So some of the ways that I integrate that. One of the biggest ways that I build on my own skills and that I find ways is through idea exploration. 
So a uh, bit of a guilty thing that I do, and I've shared this with some colleagues, is I actually have a single spot on my calendar that I block off all week that is actually just for reading. It's 45 minutes. It's on Fridays. It's in the morning. I'm not going to say what time it is because I don't want anyone to start double booking over it, but it's in my calendar. And during that time, I tend to read uh, magazines, really primarily, from HBR to stuff published by MIT. And that really is about how do I be better at my job, right? And that coffee and magazine time that I set aside builds on my leadership skills, primarily from HBR, or my industry knowledge from MIT publications or digital publications elsewhere that I'm reading for something more specific. So I am using work time for that. But at the same time, it is work time that very much is, you know, a part of my job, right? It is making me better at performing there. And I'm not spending my whole week doing that during the clock either. Am I worried about the fact that like, oh, maybe that means that I'm working 45 minutes less that day? I'm not because I know what the demands of my job are. And the reality is that the company is going to get that back for me in one way or another, whether that's an early morning the day before, a late night the day after, or an unexpected incident on the weekend. And because I'm looking at things from that holistic point of view of it all being a work and life integration, it means that I understand that there is that give and take. And it's also important for me, I love where I work, but for any employer that I would go to work at, to know that there is that flexibility, that if the demands are 24 seven, 365, knowing that there are other things that you're gonna have to do as well, right? How do, you, how do you leverage time to do other things? And what does that give and take? I used to spend a lot of my time uh, reading during my commute. And I actually have round trip around a three hour commute to work every day. Now, of course, that was before the pandemic. Now I have no commute at all. I go to my living room, right? And I have a table set up there. So I lost that time. But what I used to do is I used to use that to read. And I would be really focused on reading very specifically catered towards problems that I was trying to solve at work. What are skill sets that I'm trying to build? What are conversations that I'm having that are difficult? What are things that I'm not able to move? Or what are technologies that I need to onboard to to be able to talk with my team about or steer the company in the right direction? I've had to shift how I approach this now that we're in a all work remote scenario. Because for me, it's very tough for me to spend that mental energy to be like, I'm just going to sit down and read a book. But there are other things that I do, right? I like to work out every day after work. It's one of my habits. And when I do that, it's very easy for me to consume audio or video at the same time. So I've switched over in that case to LinkedIn learning. So I'm getting two things done at the same time. I'm taking care of myself, right, with a workout. But at the same time, I'm also getting a mental workout in listening to LinkedIn learning. And that works better for me than reading in the current scenario. Now, when it comes to books, so it doesn't all have to be work. But when it does come to work books that I'm reading for, uh, for play, so to speak, right, I like to find ones that also build into my private skills as well as my work skills. So there are some, and I have an image of one up here right now on the screen, Racing the Beam, that to me is a fun book, right? And everything kind of in that platform study series that talks about uh, maybe legacy technologies or systems and how those systems that were built and the software that was built on them integrates and how those influence one another. To me, that is fun reading. But at the same time, it also has given me a different perspective to problem solving. And I look for that too in how I kind of curate my fun reading, right? This is something that I'm interested in deeply. And sometimes that, that slight distraction, while still saying tangential to kind of your core of what you work on, will give you different ways of looking at problems, right? Like, oh, they were dealing with the Atari, which had these limitations for graphics, for processing, and they overcame it in this way. I clearly don't have as restrictive limitations as some of the older computer systems. But at the same time, it's like, how do I overcome the limitations that I have? How am I solving those problems? Who am I going to? Who am I talking to? And, and getting inspiration from what they did can give me very different windows of creativity into how I can explore problem solving myself. Another way is idea generation and reinforcement. And this talk totally counts as one of those, right? Finding ways to say either in writing or at conference talks, uh, my ideas in a clear way, hopefully so that others can understand them, forces me to look at my own ideas, to reflect internally, and to solidify what it is that I'm thinking. At the same time, it gives me an opportunity to be creative in, in a maybe a not traditionally creative way in the sense of a conference talk, but at least in terms of writing professionally into how do I structure my ideas? How do I put this down? And this can also serve multiple goals for me. So when I write, particularly blog posts, I do that outside of work, right? That is after working hours. So this first one, how to get promoted while working from home is an article that I wrote pretty much after we all shifted to working remotely during the pandemic. And I wrote this for a couple of target audiences, but I will say one of those audiences was also myself, right? It was, uh, what are my expectations of myself? What are my expectations of my team now that we've all shifted to working from home, right? 
uh, less so about getting a promotion and more so about expectation setting. Now, this is something that to me would have been uh, vaguer or more nebulous if I didn't put it into writing. But going through the exercise of writing something here that I eventually published to the public really forced me to go through that process. At the same time, it built on a lot of skills actually related to software and management, right? Like, what are the most essential things for me to say? What are the order? What is the order in which that I say those things, right? Are these things clear, right? And how are they curated? And those kind of uh, backlog management skills, even though it's part of writing and part of an outline, definitely bleed into so many other things that I do, including my personal work, which I'll get into in a slide or two. The same is true for this article here in the center. But when, I, uh, when we look at the next image over these post idea titles, like this is another part of idea generation. And this doesn't have the reinforcement element of actually writing the post or of getting ready to give a talk uh, to, to any audience, be that digital or be that in person. But I have a number of things that I use. I use Google Keep uh, where I just let my ideas run freely and I kind of just write down the bullet points for what they are. So here I have blog posts to the side of that. So I'm showing you those, but these are just ideas that come to mind for like, maybe I should write a blog post about this. And it allows me to unburden myself mentally with having what that backlog is in the back of my head, right? I'm not sitting there and the next time I go to write being like, what should I write a blog post about? What is the idea that I wanna say? It's not a chore. Uh, I already have a list. I've already had all of these ideas. It's more about opening up that menu and not having to recall or spend that mental energy for like, what were these great ideas that I had? What were these things that I wanted to do? I already have that documented. So before I shift over to my personal work, I'm going to actually share with you a trailer from a game that I recently released called Magiduel, which is definitely something that I built on the side. So Magidool is a game that I built after hours, right? So once the work day is done, right? And, and if I don't have to pause and go back to it, it's something that I would pick up on the side quite often. And it is part of skill sharpening. So for me, it is a creative outlet. I had this idea for a game. I had this idea for this mashup between a, a bullet hell player versus player, platforming, pet raising, kind of everything all together that I really wanted to make. I wanted to make this for me. Right? But how do you have the energy, especially when working in a field like engineering, to go code after that? So I haven't actually coded, I'll admit, professionally during the workday for almost five years now. And that's quite a bit of my career. But even before I switched over to being exclusively in management, I did code on the side. I would go home after a full day coding and code. And I have some rules for that that I set up for me and how the rules for how you manage your energy are gonna be different than the rules for myself. But one of the key rules I had for me is I could not use any languages or tools that I use at work, right? And that's because it is a different type of energy and it's a different type of context switch. If you're building things for the web, you're using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, like what have you, right? You're in this particular mode. When I was working at agencies, I was delivering for clients. I was writing to their code standards, right? For what they were asking to be delivered. And that took a different type of mental energy to have that pattern recognition like, what does this language look like? And what am I working on here? And a different type of uh, rigor to make sure that I was uh, adhering to their standards. Then I would go home and the language that I, I prefer to use after hours is Lua, right? And I would switch to a very different language from what I was writing in the day, which gave me that context switch that, oh, I still might be coding, but this is for me. This is, this is separate from the work that I'm doing for others. This is some work that I'm doing for myself. Now, even though I don't code during the workday, 
I still actually maintain that. If it's languages or technologies that we use at work, I try to keep that separate from what I use at home. But at the same time, building and actually coding, especially because I'm not an active developer or individual contributor during the day, keeps me technically deep to an extent so that when I talk to engineers, so when I look at their code during the workday, so that when I talk to others about architectures or patterns, I still have a sense of what I'm talking about. I'm not completely removed from that because I was just coding that last night, right? Maybe in a different language, but I had the exposure there. So this, even though I'm building the project for me, what I want to build is for me, I'm building it in a different way than I would for work, but there is a relation to that. So to me and how I work, I would feel super guilty if I was just like, oh, I'm doing nothing, right? Like I'm, I'm just going to watch Netflix for the evening, though I'll admit I, I do that a lot too, right? But it is a major feeling of accomplishment for me for like, oh, I'm actually actively coding. I'm working on something. I'm working on something that I wanted to produce. Um, but at the same time, even beyond that, I know that I'm sharpening my skills for something else, which gives another level of satisfaction. So another part beyond the code though, is any project that I work on, whether it is something that I'm coding or whether it's art related, and you'll see that I've done some other things too, I always actually maintain a backlog, right? Of everything that I need to do for that. And this is very similar to the free flowing ideas that I mentioned that I keep in notes, but this is more specific to the project and actually what I need to do. Think of it like a really robust to-do list. And there's a couple of reasons I do this as well. One is, okay, yes, so that the project can be cohesive and have all the things that I want. But another is also for unburdening myself mentally. I try to keep anything that I possibly can external to my brain, right? How do I write this down? How do I have a place that I can easily reference this? How is this not the thing that keeps me awake at night is I'm trying to fall asleep because I'm like, oh, right, I have to implement that tomorrow. I have to do that for work, right? Or wouldn't it be great if I added that to my game? If I can write it down, I can get it out of there. Right? Which also means that if I am tired, but I want to work on my game, maybe I'm excited to implement a feature, I don't have to expend energy thinking about what I'm going to build next. I know from when I had that moment of inspiration, from when I have that energy to curate what's going to happen or, or, or what the next most important thing is, I know what that is already. I have it in writing. So I can open up my editor, right, and go to work and I can be like, oh, what's next? Well, I have to refactor the, the scrolling class, right? Or I wanted to do unlockable costumes. And I can jump right into those features directly without having to pick or, or spend that decision-making energy uh, on that. So another place too, and this very much, you can see this, the center slide here is, is the, the first image from the last slide. Uh, I really try to reinforce process across everything. So I have very different ways that things are visualized. So this first image, the one with the ghost, right, is a screenshot uh, or a photo from my personal journal. And I do bullet journal. Right? You can look that up if you're, if you're not as familiar, but it's a very specific style of journaling. Um, and for me, I, I doodle as I do it too. And you can see that in my, my personal journal, I picked a slide that had nothing sensitive on it, but there's a lot of stuff about Pokemon. There's some stuff about uh, Halloween. The ghosts are there because it's October. I got a new keyboard and I was very excited for that. But I have similar systems right? across all three of these images. The first is personal, the middle is for Magidool specifically, and the last one is actually my notes for work. right? I have systems of you know, check boxes for how things happen, how I write notes, how I write bullets, but I have visual cues that show that I'm in a different environment, right? I make sure that I don't write my work notes visually in the exact same way that I do my personal journal, even though I have all the same systems of bullet points, even though I make sure both track things in the same chronological order, but when I'm looking at them, I'm in a different decompressed mode. So I'm not looking at things that have the same visual uh, impact on me as high stress, right, on all the time stuff, when I'm talking about things that I'm doing for my employer, when I switch over and I'm doing my personal journal, I have whimsical ghosts because it's Halloween, right? And, and I'm able to have that, that bit of a breather or a bit of a disconnect versus my personal one um, or my work ones. And then for my work ones too, there's a bit of whimsy tossed in. I drew a Pokeball in this instance. I like to doodle, but at the same time, it, it, it is more serious and they are more focused about what it is that I'm actually writing down versus the embellishments around it. But across all systems, I maintain a system uh, and having that common system makes it so that no matter where I'm writing notes, I know the patterns that I'm writing them in and how I'm getting information out of them. Of course, right, I've talked a lot about, oh, I make games on the side because it, it reinforces my skills for work, right? And it makes me a better engineer or a better leader or a better curator. I write because it solidifies my ideas, but I also make a lot of things for me. And some of those things for me really don't have applications that tie into building my own skills professionally. Some are just for decompression. Of course, the things that I have on screen here, some of them are Twitter bots, others are games. One of them is, is a little piece of hardware. And for those things, of course, there's tie-in for like, 
uh, whether or not that's even just like planning out how the process works and making sure that I'm organized for how I go through it. And that ties into myself as a professional and builds skills for me there. But then there are things like these felt uh, stegosaurs, right, that I, that I sewed together. And things like that have very little impact or reference to how is my work going. Those are for me to decompress. Those are for me to have the satisfaction of making and delivering something at the end of the day. The same for the pogs that are up on screen. And that, that to me is just as important. It's most important to keep making, right? To, to keep building those skills that you're creating things, right? That you're, you're pushing things forward and that you're growing yourself, whether that's something directly, directly career related or whether that's something that's fun on the side or something you just wanted to try Right? Like, so to me, you can tell if you have any experience sewing that I am not great at it by looking at those stegosauruses, right? But it is something that I wanted to play around with. And it's something that I got to do by doing that side project. And I had that same satisfaction of sewing those for a couple hours as I did for building Magidool for two years at the, at the output of that, right? So getting those wins is, is important to me, right? As well as trying those new skills and, and finding time to work on what I want to work on. So the other bit to this is taking breaks from things. And I wanna caveat this kind of heavily because I don't want you to stop, right? If you're making things, if you're learning, if you're improving yourself, that needs to always be going, right? And it's difficult to manage time, especially if you're looking at things through the lens that I gave earlier of everything being life all the time, right? Because that, that kind of levels what time is, but you do have to manage your energy, right? And so to me, it may be taking a break from coding this game on the side to code this other game or from coding on the side to making some, you know, sewn felt stegosaurs, right? And that is ways that I help balance and manage my energy. If I've had a particularly difficult day at work, right? And now things have wound down, most of the people have gone home, like, okay, I'll binge Netflix every now and again too. But I make sure to me that that's not my day-to-day -day habit, that I continue to create things and, and build my own skills through how I create things on the side. But it is, it is an act and a balancing act to manage that energy. And there are ways that you can find things to create that let you do that as well. Yeah, and my biggest thing really is, is don't stop. I started this uh, talk by basically saying when you enter your career, it becomes difficult to grow yourself. There's a chance that you're in a job at some point where what you're doing in the day-to-day -day is more task-oriented, where what your tasks are that you're performing aren't making you better at what you do. They're just things that you're getting done. But how do you get to that next level? How do you build yourself up, right? There are so many ways to do that, and there are so many ways to do that positively, creatively, that let you maintain that energy that you have without just going home from that and then, uh, and then not working on yourself in that same way. And always look for ways that you can, you can incorporate both while maintaining that energy level. I think now we're gonna switch over if there are actually any questions from the room. Uh, that's it for me and, uh, and I'd love to hear anything that any of you have on your mind. Hey everyone, this is this is Brendan. I am your sorry. One second, I am trying to turn on my screen. Hey, how's it going? Uh, okay. Hey, William, thank you so much for the incredible presentation. No, for... thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think everything's looking okay. So I'm kind of managing the. Um, the screen, the OBS system right now. I'm kind of the tech, I am the organizer of Rad Lab along with Cynthia Vu, and I'm also the tech. So uh, yeah, I've got this headset on. I've been talking to William the whole time, preparing tonight's presentation, and it's just been a really great thing. For those of you who don't know, uh, William is my friend. Uh, we met maybe around 2011 or 2012 when I was the administrative assistant at Parsons School of Design part of the new school. Uh, William had graduated and we didn't we didn't take classes together, but we met through a mutual friend and uh, William has just always been like a super inspirational person in my life. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, I've had a bit of a string of being a deadbeat and uh, William has just been like, hey, Brendan, check out this, um, you know, doing good work and being really reflective on the work you're doing, whether it's for your job or for yourself have just really changed my life. Uh, I actually think the whole reason I'm kind of at Princeton right now is just uh, ha is because of having William in my life and being such a great friend. So anyway, I hope I didn't flatter you too much because, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna hit you with some hard questions now. 
By the way, if, uh, if anyone's on the Slack channel right now, you can drop your questions into the Slack and I will uh, gladly relay them to William. But I just kind of, I want to get started off by talking about where to get started. Uh, like, William, you, you have built like such an incredible momentum uh, in your in your life and also in your your artistic practice and also professionally and like where does that even come from like what what does day one look like for someone who <laughs> who just like needs to needs to start building themselves even a little bit like not even just on the side yeah so so this that that that's an awesome question so I had mentioned when I talked about magical that that was actually a two-year project for me and, and it is not done. The idea is that that is going to actually live forever and I'm going to keep adding on to it. We'll see how long forever is. But I, I do not recommend jumping in with a two-year project, right? That is actually how you're going to burn yourself out, is, is by having your career that you're managing and managing a two-year scope at the same time. That, that takes building some muscle, right, before you get there. I think looking for projects, um, whether or not they're, they're going to direct, if, you, if you're not used to that practice of building outside and building yourself regularly, Look for projects you can accomplish in an afternoon, right? Like that is a hundred percent way to start. Get yourself uh, really used to that awesome feeling of completing a thing, right? And those projects don't have to be big. They don't have to be related to your, your discipline or if you're a student and during the work first, even what you just learned, like maybe that's just taking a, a piece of paper and like drawing your name in a fancy way. Like it can be that small. But like start as small as you as you can, as small as you're comfortable for something you can accomplish and readily get that win from, and then make that a recurring practice. So when I uh, when I started my own company, right, and, and that is how I, I exited university is is we'd already been running a business for a year while still in school, um, and it was about a year and a half into running my company that I really started to do these projects for myself, right, and I had a rule for them actually, which was that they couldn't take longer than three hours. And I had to do one every weekend, right? And I missed weekends. I'm not perfect, right? But but it was that practice over many weekends of doing those three-hour projects that eventually I was like, oh, well, this other cool thing that I kind of want to do is going to take a bit longer or it's going to take two weekends. And, and I built up to that. I've had rules beyond that too, that things can't last more than a week. But then Magidool took two years, right? But it, but it was a it was a long buildup before I was willing and, and had the energy and, and the, the organizational skills to do something that big on the side for myself without being exhausted. So start small, find ways to give yourself that feeling of a win, right? And, and to express yourself, to build something creative, regardless of what that is. And then after you get that muscle memory, you can be like, how does this relate to what I do at work? How does this build my skills as a professional or as an individual uh, and start to, to fold that into your recipes? Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, um, we we all saw the the trailer for Magidool, and I think uh, maybe not all of it was revealed to our our viewers. But for for people watching, I will drop a link to Magidool on itch.io for you to check out. But Magidool is a two year project that William's been working on mostly because I think he's found it difficult to find a stopping point and you've you've just continually added features <laughs> to it where in my, I, it kind of feels like four games in one which makes it this like really I don't know I uh, I have a lot of experience with games like I used to work at the NYU Game Center I've been playing games my my whole life and there's something about Magidool that feels kind of at like the folk art level where I just like can't seem to think of any other game quite like it and that it's come from just like uh, a tradition of like indie game developers doing game design just for the joy of it um and also that you've just like poured <laughs> pretty much anything you're interested in to it just kind of stacking it and and bringing it together but um yeah you have this like total holistic approach to to your life to work you know it's all life um it's interesting to see how you bring them in bring in all the elements to kind of together and you'll like uh, arrange them to kind of like uh, create contrast, you know, like you will um, use one language at work, but then use something completely different in order to like create a relationship between the two for you to kind of work with. But I'm sorry, I've, I meant <laughs> this should have been a question, but mostly I'm just kind of like reflecting on, you know, how your process um, doesn't you, you're a professional and you present yourself very professionally, but I think a lot 
of what you have is like a very holistic artistic practice. You go out into the world and you take notes, you collect those notes and you're always reflecting on what you're doing. Does that, that seem fair? And also, I mean, I think a lot of it comes from uh, being exposed to like the art school training. Sorry, this is. <laughs> There's a few things there. Yeah. I'll, take, I'll take the mic from you for a second. Yes, please. So let me dig into a couple of this. I'll, I'll go in order of kind of like what you talked about. So from Magical's point of view, you're right. It is this big thing. And actually, I've had a lot of stopping points. Like, that's a secret. There have been a lot of, like, ways that I could stop. And right now, I'm kind of at one, and I'm working at a different thing on the side for a moment before I come back to Magidul and, and, and get back into that. Um, but I think for me as well, when I have, like, these larger ideas, it's also the boilerplate for building how they are. And knowing that, to me, that expends a different type of energy, right? If I'm going to start a brand new game or a brand new project, like, I also have to set up the scaffolding, the framework for how that works. Whereas in, I already have Magidool, which is mature and, and robust, like from a coding point of view. So I'm like, oh, what if I want to build a pet raising game? And it's like, I can either build that from scratch or just do it here. And then I get that same kind of satisfaction for building that thing, but I didn't have to do it from the very beginning. So Magidool might be a two-year project, but to your point, there's really four or five projects inside of that that I've just kind of used Magidool as, you know, my my toolbox or, or toy set. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's... It, it's so interesting. Uh, it's just kind of like an artifact of game design. And also it's interesting because it's meant so much to you. And like, I like experience it knowing who you are and it's it's super neat. <laughs> the, um, the other part too, and, and I, I didn't mention this during my talk, is uh, the things that I release don't get viewed or used by a lot of people. And that that in such a different way, like not only doesn't bother me, but like maybe I'm happier with it. Like I'm okay with it. And I think it's because I am making these things for, for the art of making, right? I am making them because I want to get better, right? In, in different ways, or I want to build this thing, right? That's what drives it. Um, and at work, I, I think a lot about the end user. I think a lot about the, the consumer, about who's interacting with the product. And that takes a very specific and a, and a large amount of mental energy, right? To have that level of empathy for users and, and consider how all of that works. When I'm building things outside of that context though, like they are for me, right? Yeah. So the, the honest reaction is like, if you play my game and you're like, wow, this is bad. Like you can even tell me and I'm gonna be like, cool. Like, like right. because it's, it's, if you enjoy it, I mean, that is awesome, right? Like I'll smile, don't get me wrong. But if you don't like it, that's also fine because it wasn't built for you to like it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was built for me to go through that practice. Yeah. Following up on that, we have a question from one of our uh, student viewers, um, and it, it kind of builds on, like you mentioned how empathy in a professional context can be pretty exhausting. And okay, so let's get to the question. Emma asks, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Anderson, Anderson for sharing about his experiences. I found this talk to be very insightful. My question is, how do you cope with side projects becoming too emotionally overwhelming? I find myself getting very excited about my side projects and maintaining enthusiasm can be exhausting. Yeah, like uh, that that's an awesome question and, and that opening for empathy. Literally every emotion is exhausting. I, 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 <laughs> and, and, I mean, they are, right? Like if you're, if you're angry, that's exhausting. If you're sad, that's exhausting. If you're excited, it's exhausting, right? Like, and, and to me, part of that, and, and I'm gonna tangent and then come back, Right? Part of that is also a similar thing to how I handle the technical part of that, right? Why do I, why do I use Lua instead of the stack of technology that we use at work, right? And it's the same thing if you're, if you're thinking about in terms of a meal, right? If all four things on your plate are mashed potatoes, right? Like you're gonna, you're gonna get very tired of eating mashed potatoes like during that meal. If those are four different things, you get to rotate, you get to go back and forth, you get to refresh your palate, right? And I, and I think emotions are very much the same thing, right? Like, if we're just happy all the time or or if we're just concerned about others all the time and never look at ourselves right like that that can be really exhausting so for the question though you know you're working on a personal project you you have that excitement you're you're burning into it and then you're getting exhausted i think i would look at the other levers right i don't think excitement is a bad thing but like are you putting too much time into it right like is that more energy than you can handle maybe you need to actually dial back the the frequency that you work on it or the other bit I, and, and this is what I encounter a lot, like in, in what I build, am I exhausted because I haven't actually defined what I'm looking to build? And I think the first four to six months of Magidool was actually really rough for me. 
And everything I manage, I manage through that kind of like backlog system. But for some reason, I didn't do that when I started Magidual. So I, I was just, I, I was just coding every night and like adding things and excited. And I had this broad vision of this, like, what am I building? I'm building this cool thing, but I didn't actually really know what was next. I didn't have that planned. And I was, I was using a lot of that energy, which was, you know, fueled and, 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 uh, and, and grown by that excitement to, to make all of these decisions and decision-making is really like the, that is the thing that, that drains you the most in the day. So if you're, if you're excited for a project, funnel that excitement when you can into, uh, into actionable items and what you can build out so that when you're actually building, you're, you're using that excitement to build, not that excitement to make decisions. Um, hopefully this is helpful a little bit or, or at least steers you into, into the direction. For sure. Uh, what you mentioned about all emotions being exhausting. Uh, for our viewers, stay tuned for my rad lab that I'm hoping to do next semester called Cultivating Your Void, uh, <laughs> which is my, my self-help approach to um, eliminating as much thing as many things from your life as possible so that you're only left with what's essential. It's kind of the Marie Kondo approach to like emotions. your, your spiritual management. Anyway, I'm just kind of joking around. I don't know if I'll actually do that, but if people want <laughs> feel like cultivate, cultivating your void has a really cool ring to it. Um, so yeah, we've got one more question, uh, from Cynthia Vu and it's a two parter and you've definitely touched on some parts of it already. Feel free to repeat yourself or give us something new. So Cynthia asks, uh, I'm a senior graduating soon, and I was wondering if you also had any advice about transitioning from college and especially experiencing burnout to moving into a first job. Uh, and then Cynthia's second question or follow-up is, and do you have any advice um, specific to the uncertainties of postgraduate life in general, and how did it go for you until you reached the balance you have, and are there specific things you would do differently? So it's kind of, it's a long question, but... Go yeah, it. it's, it's a good one. Uh, yeah, so so we'll start with like, what is it like for that transition from from school to, to career, right? Uh, so the secret is that you're already started on your career, right? Like by, by going to school. And and I, I went to school, Brendan talked about it. I didn't go to school for engineering. I actually have no formal coding training whatsoever, uh, but it's an industry that I've come very far in, right? So, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, you went to school for something you're passionate about and you're going to find a fulfilling career in there. If there are pivots along that way too, it's not that your career started and stopped, it, started and stopped, right? Like that's, that's you moving through that journey of like your job and how you grow your skills. And, you know, if there are pivots, right, which there were for me, right, it's uh, everything I did before like those skills built up in a, in a very different or unexpected or pleasant way into what I do now, right? What about that transition though, that moment? For me, I, I was very lucky uh, and stressed at the same time, lucky and stressed because I started a company while I was still in college and uh, that company was successful enough by the time I graduated that I was able to be self-employed at the start, right? So I knew what to expect because I was my own boss, but I didn't know what to expect in terms of, uh, you know, I wasn't living in, in you know, uh, a college life anymore, right? Like now all the bills are real. Now all the client management was real before there was a safety net and, and that went away. And that was what I, what I couldn't have expected. I think I gained a lot, like from my, my own journey of starting my own company first, I think working for someone else first, uh, I would have lost some advantages, but I would have gained a lot of collaborative skills and I would have gained a lot of industry insight that I had to learn in a very difficult way. Uh, uh, having that first job as my, as my own employer. Um, and so, so that is something I would definitely, definitely reconsider. For other bits of that transition, I, I think I'm going to give advice to you that I actually give to, to my employees uh, when they get promotions, right? Uh, which is quit your old job. And, and, and that is a really big thing to me, right? Uh, I got promoted uh, from a director to a VP position, right? And when that happened, I had to quit being a director because I can't be a director and a VP at the same time. And I, I talked to the same for engineers, right? You were a junior engineer, right? Like that was great. You started, you were fresh. This was your first job maybe, and, and you grew that. You're getting promoted to a mid-level. And now it's time for you to look at what does that mean to you? Like, what does it mean to be in this position? What does it mean to perform like that at this company? And what are the differences between being a junior? I need you to quit today being a junior and I need you to, to start your new job as a mid-level engineer. So, so while your career progresses, those jobs change. So I think my advice is as you switch into the workplace, right? 
Uh, don't quit being a student as in like, you know, cliches of like student of life and keep learning forever. Obviously keep building yourself, right? That's, that's the point of my talk, but quit being a student in terms of like, when is the next test? What do I have to study for? Right? Like, cause you're now you're, you're in a sprint that that's what, that's what education was. And now you're in a marathon for the rest of your life. I don't know when that's going to end. I don't know if or, or when you're going to retire and you kind of have to run it like that and manage energy like that. And there'll be definitive failures along the way. Um, for where you we, where you learn that differently. My, my other bit of advice for that transition, and, and this gets easier the further into the career you get. So, so starting out there, there might be some difficult decisions, but is be picky about your employer. Be as picky as you can, right? As is reasonable. And I think that's because, you know, you will have employers or jobs throughout life that have expectations that make it impossible to balance that energy, right? And, and to do your own things. If you are working 16 hour days, right? There's no way you can go home and do anything other than eat and sleep. And, and I think looking out for things like that, looking for, for bosses or people who are, are gonna be supportive and, and who, are gonna, uh, who are gonna help build on you is, uh, is definitely something that, you know, look for, look for the opportunity for. Um, but, you know, starting out that, that is gonna be tougher um, as you build up more skills and you are in more demand and you have that experience you, you get to be a bit more picky there. Um, but when you're starting out, at the very least, learn what you don't like and what isn't working for you. Because then when you have the bargaining chips to say like, hey, I'm never going to do that again, right? You'll know what it is that you never want to be in the situation for again. Ooh, wow. That was an epic answer. Uh, Cynthia, I hope you wrote all that down. <laughs> uh, um, William, uh, I think... I think it's kind of that time. Um, there aren't any other questions in the Slack channel. And I think just this Q and A has just been so incredible. I mean, I've known you for almost 10 years and just every time there's something, every time we speak, I find like a new way to be like inspired about my work and my life. And it's just, it's really cool. I feel like, you know, you know, I, I organize this whole thing and you come on and like, it's mostly for the students and I'm like, yeah, let's go do something now. Um, so I'm just really inspired and totally jazzed. And I hope everyone who uh, tuned in is also. Um, but that's that's kind of it for tonight's Rad Lab. Um, William, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It was a, a, a super pleasure. I wish I could have been there in person to, to see all of your faces for the talk. Um, but, uh, but really fantastic questions. And, and hopefully you'll have me back one day. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that would be really awesome. Uh, I'm going to hold you to that, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>